Welcome to the Association of Taxpayers 2015 election interviews. I'm Jerry Stowe, and with me is Kathy Baker. We're members of the Association of Taxpayers, and tonight we're joined by Josh Sear. Welcome, Josh. Thanks for Thanks having Thanks for me. coming out. Okay. Great, thank you. Josh, would you like to start out, take a couple minutes just to tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. So uh, I grew up in Idaho, Pocatello, Idaho. I uh, moved out here to go to University of New Hampshire in 1992, uh, graduated with a business degree, uh, moved to Portsmouth in 97, became a partner of a marketing agency, uh, was there for several years, uh, then co-founded a software technology startup as a software developer, actually. Uh, left that company around five years ago, uh, started my own co-working space, the first one in, in Portsmouth, uh, in downtown. And uh, about a year and a half ago, that co-working space was bought by a nonprofit and uh, then renamed Alpha Loft. And so now we're a, we're a nonprofit that serves the state of New Hampshire. And our goal, my job, is to help founders of high growth innovation based startups and help them get better outcomes and have a higher success rate for their new startups. And so I travel all around the state and, and help people with their businesses. Okay. Josh, can you tell me what motivated you to run for city council? Sure. I've, uh, I've always been civic minded, I'm passionate about. Portsmouth itself. I actually first ran for city council, I believe it was in 2001. I was still in my 20s. I had big, bushy, curly hair, if anybody remembers me back then. And uh, uh, didn't win, but I got, I did actually fairly well, considering I was an unknown 20-year-old you know, at the time. And I learned a lot uh, after that, or before and after that, I've served on numerous nonprofit boards, uh, WSEA, Pro Portsmouth, uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, involved in the Ecos Technology Roundtable and did a lot of my own kind of community involvement things. Um, in the last, I think, six years, I've been serving on the Economic Development Commission for the City of Portsmouth. So sure. I was passionate about it and I've held off in the past few years because uh, I'm a dad and my kids about to turn two and four. So I felt like they're getting a little bit easier to handle and uh, I can put a bit more time into the civic endeavors again. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Sure. Josh. The city of Portsmouth has one employee for every 22 residents. Uh, if you look at similar towns in New Hampshire, we're looking at one for every 30 residents, one for every 40 residents. I'd like to know your reaction to the fact that we have one employee for every 22 residents. Sure. What, what, so what similar towns are we looking at? Oh, for example, a town like Dover, mm -hmm. Rochester, Summersworth, okay. Hanover. Right. So uh, it is a difficult ratio, for, no doubt, especially when you break thing, uh, things down like that, the numbers that way. Uh, a city like Portsmouth has a lot going on. We have high expectations about the quality of life and, the, and what we expect out of our city services. We also have a very small population, or a much smaller population than Dover and some of the other towns. And so we tend to expect a lot. I think we get a lot more, uh, but we have a small population and so it's going to skew ratios like that. I think I understand why people would be concerned and think, you know, we might want to have less government. Uh, certainly, there's people that have those opinions. I tend to be focused on outcomes, and uh, and relative uh, ratio of uh, the taxes uh, for what we're getting, and concerned about more specific topics. Yeah. Um, what specifically do you think that we get that other towns don't get? Uh, that's a great question. Well, in some towns, it might just be you know trash service, depending on where you're at. But in uh, in Portsmouth, I think that the quality of life and the density of activities uh, that we have here puts a, a larger burden simply just on city services themselves. Uh, and uh, you know that alone, I think, uh, adds impact. Okay, Josh, the <coughs> Association of Taxpayers is obviously interested in spending, and uh, <coughs> wanted to ask you. Uh, which tax and spending pledge will you make? Uh, give you four, five choices here. A, a, zero increase in the budget. B, increase less than or equal to inflation. C, specific percentage as a maximum increase. D, reduction in spending. Or E, no pledge on spending. I think I'd probably take no pledge on spending, which is not to say that I have 
uh, interest in, in spending a lot. I pay a lot in taxes personally. I have two properties here. They also had a business. I spent a lot of money in portion of taxes. I don't have a, any interest in seeing those taxes uh, increase. And I'm happy that the city has been keeping uh, our tax increases in that just under 3% you know, threshold, generally speaking. I think that's a good target. I don't think uh, it's realistic without cutting city services to be able to uh, cap our spending, um, just the reality of, of uh, some of the obligations that we have uh, within the city to cap our spending at a specific amount and not see that grow without having significant impact. You brought up um, obligations, and that's an interesting point. If you take a look at the budget, over 80% of the budget is employee contracts, which are their salaries and their benefits. Mm -hmm controlled by those contracts. Now the council, when it comes to budget time, goes through the budget, but the contracts have already been set, so that part of the budget is set. Right. Um, do you think previous councils have protected taxpayers sufficiently when it comes to those union contracts? That's a question I wouldn't be able to answer. I, honestly, I haven't paid enough attention to those union contracts and what the mm -hmm. council had discussed uh, to have a, 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 an informed answer for that. Would you favor any changes that would make the council more directly involved in negotiating the contracts? The contracts are typically presented to the council for an up or down vote, but the council typically has very little impact or input prior. Right. Also a great question. I think, <laughs> generally speaking, the more minutia the city council gets into, uh, the harder it is to have a broader vision. Um, that said, you know, it's certainly an important topic, and I'll be I probably would have a very strong opinion about that in about two years after I'm on city council. <laughs> One of the things that, that comes up frequently with contracts is there is a, usually a subcommittee from the, from the city council that works with the negotiators and gives them instructions, et cetera. However, frequently when the budget is presented, it'll be presented on a Thursday afternoon to be voted on on the following Monday. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's adequate time? If you were a counselor, would you think that was adequate time for you to review contracts as in-depth and, and complicated as they can be? Are you saying that the counselors didn't have access to draft budgets or any other information before well, that Thursday period? The final budget usually, and it's been the case the past mm -hmm. couple of contracts, have been contracts. presented with, oh, very short, with very short time between when the final contract is presented to the council until they vote on it. Right. And likewise, should citizens have an opportunity to review it once it's uh, once it comes out? Sure, I think that's an important part of transparent government. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I I would have I'd have to actually look through a contract to determine whether that was something I need sure. weeks Understood. to go through. I mean, uh, frankly, some contracts are pretty simple, and there's only a little bit that's really varying year after year uh, or contract period to contract period, and so it may not need yeah. you know a lot of time to review. And so you know, it all comes down to the contracts, but. Uh, certainly if they're complex enough, we should have a thorough review. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, Nancy Stiles, she represents Hampton in the New Hampshire Senate. She has put forth bills to change the way the rooms and meals tax is distributed to the towns. I'd like um, some thoughts on that. I, the, <laughs> it's one of the killers for Portsmouth, uh, uh, certainly for, uh, for the amount of money that we send out, as, as you already know, the amount of money that we send out in rooms and meals tax is is way out of whack with the amount of money we get back from the state. And so I think a lot of work needs to be done uh, for ad advocating on the, on the state level uh, to adjust that in, in some way, whether that's simply uh, ensuring that we get more of our fair sh share uh, uh, of that percentage back, or that's also providing us an opportunity to um, leverage uh, a a fee or some sort of additional amount of money that we can put towards our hotels so that we can recover some of the stronger impact we get from tourism. I think those are all things that, um, you know, our hounds are bound right now until, until, until the state's going to act. And, and given the nature of uh, uh, the political environment in the state house, uh, I'm not sure I'm too hopeful. <laughs> um, are you saying you would favor an additional fee if we aren't able to get more of the current pie back? I'm, if there was an additional fee, I, I know that has been proposed, and I think, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's worth a, a, a thorough discussion. If there's an additional fee, for example, a dollar per room or something like that, it's leveraged for, you know, uh, to cover the tourism impact. That's one way of us, for us, uh, and we virtually have no other way of recovering uh, 
you know, the impact from tourism on, our, on a popular city. I would rather have the Roman meals tax uh, uh, adjusted so that we're receiving our fair share. Now, you mentioned the impact of tourism. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on what your perception of the impact of tourism is? Sure, sure. So uh, there's lots of very uh, strong impacts. I mean, certainly we have, uh, we're a, a foodie mecca, and we're not going to have the quality of restaurants and the pubs and all the other uh, uh, cultural aspects to our city. We didn't have a strong base coming to our town, and so there's a lot of good impacts uh, that we have uh, from being a, a regional and national destination. However, that also does put impact uh, on our uh, on our budget for police and for fire and for other uh, areas of our budget, uh, which are simply going to make a town our size uh, simply need uh, more activity, more uh, more staff, more uh, time in the streets, all those sort of things. Then a, a small town with, for example, no downtown and no nightlife and no activities uh, of our same population. So some way that we can uh, uh, be accounting for that would be great. The more directly accounting for that so it's not coming back to my pocketbook uh, or you know someone from Elwyn Park or, or anywhere else in town. Okay. Josh, you know there's a correlation between when we let a contract <clears throat> and the amount of artwork that's, that's provided for. And I just wonder, uh, would you favor spending $150,000 for artwork in a garage? Yes. You would? Yep. Okay. I'm a can big you, fan of art you, and culture enforcement. Okay. I think it's really important. What kind of art do you think we would get for $150,000? <laughs> I think that would be... Uh, well, it's appropriate to a garage. I'm just sure. curious. Sure. No, I, I think uh, I would love to be on on that committee. I think that would probably uh, fall under art speak and, and goes in that path. I'd be really interested right. to hear Nancy uh, Pearson's uh, response to that. But uh, uh, I would like to see local artists. I'd like to see uh, 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 art that uh, uh, represents multiple different artists. And, and But ultimately, they know that's not, I don't think picking art is in the purview of city council. We have a lot of other uh, important tasks to Sure. to focus on. No, I just wanted to yeah. see you, how you felt about the expenditure. You mentioned something. local artists. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that in the past that, and just for the, the, the viewers sure. that aren't aware, um, a previous council passed um, a rule that when a new building is built or a new development is made, paid for by the taxpayers in Portsmouth, I believe it is one and a half percent of the cost would be added to it and then spent on art. And back to my question to you, do you think that that art should be done by local or regional artists? I think there should be a great preference for that. I think that uh, you know, part of the reason why people come to town is for the authentic Portsmouth experience. And, and you know, why not showcase the great talent that we have uh, right in our backyard? It's not to say we should you know, uh, ignore things beyond Portsmouth. There's a lot of, uh, it's important for us to have a broader perspective. Uh, but uh, sure, yeah, let's make sure we're highlighting our own too. Okay. And that money is spent locally. I'm a big proponent of Seacoast Local. I'm not sure how familiar you, you are with that mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. organization. I'm, a, I'm personally a member. And, uh, and sure, every dollar we spend locally is a dollar that has a lot more impact on our local economy than a dollar that we spend outside of our local economy. And so, uh, you know, totally guilty. I go to Walmart to get diapers for my kids. Uh, but I do like to also put my money locally when I can. The city hired um, three full-time public relations people in the last year, and the police department has recently been discussing hiring a public relations person. Do you think that the city, different departments in the city, should be hiring public relations personnel? I don't know enough uh, about that to have an educated decision. I, mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I would have to know a lot more uh, uh, to really have a, a thoughtful response. Okay. Yeah. okay. Josh, uh, do you think businesses should get variances which allow them to uh, build few or no parking spaces and then be able to uh, lease city-owned parking spaces below market rates in our parking garages? I want to make sure I answer this one correctly. Can you read the question one more time? Sure. Basically what I'm yeah. saying is uh, should we give them variances to say you don't have to build parking spots right. and then we lease them city-owned spots at or below the market rate so they're not paying for, they're paying less than the market rate for their parking. Either right. leasing them or leasing, e their, leasing their, their tenants or, yeah, or their, their customers. Tenants or whatever. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, generally the, the idea for leasing a uh, uh, parking spot in the garage, any 
lease that's going to happen is going to be below the rate you would pay if you were right. simply paying an hourly. So any lease is going to be you know, below market rate. And uh, the ability to have a, a, a lease spot, I think, is important for businesses uh, in downtown. So I, I don't think there's a negative there. The real question, I think, comes down to should we be having variances that remove the parking requirements? Uh, and I think generally, I think uh, <laughs> that's tough because the, the rules keep changing, yeah. frankly. Uh, what we see for one building and what we have coming down the uh, pipe for others uh, uh, varies. I've been involved a lot in parking. I was on the uh, subcommittee uh, for parking garage for the ADC. I mean, we've been working on parking related topics for a long time. There's, uh, so there's, there's so much to discuss. We could have a whole topic just about <laughs> we parking. Yeah, we don't have time for it. So I uh, just yeah. sum it down in saying uh, it all comes down to why that variance exists and what's really going on in our building. Generally speaking, there's a reason why we're requiring parking. So the default should always be we're, we need to have this parking. I can't know what the variance would be for a particular building, and so I'm not, right. I'm not a hardline person. I think that's not good governance. I think you need to have perspective yeah. that's broader. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to be just uh, giving it away willy-nilly for anybody that yeah. asks. Well, I, I, I understand the variance point. Sure. The heart of the question is really, should they be getting their lease spaces below market? And I think what I understood from you is you, you, you don't have any problem with that. No, I think that okay. lease spaces are, are typical that way. I think once we have our second parking garage, still underway, we will have some leverage uh, to maneuver some discounted parking for residents, uh, for people that work in town, to be, to be at the, the, the further parking garage so that we can have the downtown more expensive parking garage, right, for the people that are coming in. And I think that's going to give us a lot of flexibility. Uh, one, of the, one of the difficulties for, for having businesses move into downtown, and you, know, you might see this is, is uh, a lot of businesses over a few people have a really hard time locating downtown because they can't find parking for their employees. There, yeah. there needs to be some sort of program for that. And, and uh, on top of that, for frankly, for a lot of folks that happen to work on the first floor of downtown, parking itself uh, can be a fairly sizable chunk of their take-home pay. And so anything we can offer that's, again, supporting our downtown businesses, their employees, and our, and our citizens, I'm in favor of as long as it's not having a financial impact that doesn't make any sense. Okay. We're going to move Thank on you. to the sewage sure. treatment plant. Um, both Pierce Island and Pease are being considered for the treatment of sewage. Um, the EPA is requiring that we up our, our sewage treatment process so that we do a better job releasing less into the river. Um, but what many people might not know is right now the new plant being discussed at um, Pierce Island fits in the same footprint, but there's no guarantee the EPA doesn't come back with more requirements and has periodically done so. Um, what are your thoughts on the location of the water treatment, sewage treatment plant? Right. I, unfortunately, I just didn't have enough time to research that topic. I saw it actually, you know, uh, uh, I thought it was going to come up, and unfortunately, I just didn't have enough time to, to do the research on, the, on that particular topic, so I don't have specific thoughts on where that should be, aside from we really ought to be making sure we can plan for the future. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me just say this. If, if it included increasing the size, of, and I'm not going to get you to commit here or ask you to, <laughs> I'm but something life, to right? think about is if, if they reduce the uh, increase the requirement that we had to reduce the amount of parts per million they were dumping, and we couldn't stay within the footprint, and we actually had to take over the pool, the dog walking area, et cetera. In other words, turn the whole, right. most of Pierce Island into it. That's something you, you might have to consider. And then you would have to consider whether you want to go there or go out to, out to Pease. Sure. And yeah, so I, I mean, just generally, knowing where, generally yeah. knowing where the, where the, the plant is, there's a fair amount of land between that and the pool. I don't know that the pool would necessarily yeah. be a risk, but uh, the dog park, the what dog walking area, uh, yeah. certainly. What that likelihood is, I mean, we could do what ifs all day I long. Don't I don't know what that likelihood is, uh, so, you know, it's we a what if what at this point. Say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a question. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, you want to? Okay, I'll sure. take it. Um, transparency and government accountability is the next topic we want to talk about. There have been a number of conflict of interest issues that have been brought up and alluded to. Um, 
what would you do to prevent conflicts of interest, both with regards to elected officials as well as boards and commissions in the city? I think we'd have to address them as they, as they come up. I, I think that from what I've seen over the years, uh, conflict of interest have been brought up um, legitimately, of course, um, but also uh, as, a, as a political tool uh, by groups that are looking for sure. their sway. And that's just how that's, that's government, that's how those things work. I think in a very small town, you're going to be really hard pressed to have any important topic where someone isn't somehow benefiting in even the slightest way. I, you know, you, you, we're voting on doing something that's beautifying the South End. How many city councilors live in the South End? They're going to see the value, pro you know, the value of their property go up or something like that. Um, I, inter I interact with tons of local businesses in town. Right? And so I think that there's always going to be the slightest touches of that. We're, you know, we're a small uh, community. Um, but surely when there's uh, a conflict of interest which involves money at stake or uh, uh, there's going to be some sort of sway that uh, is potential, then we have to bring it up. And we have to be really upfront about it and clear. Yeah. And I think it needs to pass muster with out, uh, people outside of perhaps myself. Would you favor broader disclosure rules to help prevent conflicts of interest from happening behind the scenes? Well, I don't, I don't know that there have been conflicts of interest going on behind the scenes. So the disclosure rules, I, I, again, this is like uh, what these rules are. I can't say I'm in favor of it. I would think it would be, I can't imagine anybody would say they're in favor of rules they don't know about. But uh, for myself, I have seen people uh, suggesting things like, uh, you know, you fight, show your taxes or you open up all the kinds of uh, things about my personal life uh, so that I can sit on city council. And uh, I might be willing to do limited amounts of that, but mm -hmm. I think the second we do that, we are limiting so many great, wonderful, qualified, intelligent people yeah. who are not going to want to have to do anything with that kind of nonsense. And we're going to have a government that's going to be run by the select few that are willing to put up with it. Yeah. And so I think we have to be really careful with what those rules might be yeah. so we don't filter that people out. Well, in this a specific example, I was thinking that there have been uh, cases where people's spouses w worked for a particular segment and they were voting on the contract that, so they were going to be a in, you know, direct increase into the money in their household. Now, that's pretty so, significant. Right. So clearly, should they recuse if, your, should sure. they recuse if I'm voting on something that is going to directly result in money in my house uh, directly for myself or my wife, sure. If there happens to be something that's going to have a moderate economic, economic impact sure. to a company of 50 people, of which I've got a salary that's set in stone, and there's no direct correlation, then I don't know that that's actually okay. coming back into the household. So that's good. Yeah. So the level of it. Is right. It, yeah. Well, right. It, yeah. Okay. Good. Would you commit to, if you observed a conflict of interest in one of a fellow council member's vote, would you commit to calling the attention before a vote? Sure. Yeah. I think that's just you know what we should be expecting from from everyone. Right? To that's do it government. for themselves yeah. is what we would all hope yeah. for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, honestly. I think that there could be times, I, who knows, I, maybe it'll be me. Uh, we get excited and we get passionate and we don't necessarily think about it. And so I'm all for anybody else calling. Call me out. That's great. Sure. You think I have a conflict? Let's get it all cleared out because I'd rather deal with it now before a vote than have some big hoopla after the vote that's going to muck something up and cost us a lot of money and legal fees or something else. So it should be called out, absolutely. Okay. Josh, it, you said you knew a lot about the You've been involved in the parking situation here in Portsmouth, Georgia. <laughs> a little bit. I just wanted to ask you, um, do you think that the parking garage, and I've heard this statement been made by several people, that can be built without any burden at all to the taxpayer? I think, yeah. I, so the question, so the, the threshold for whether the parking garage is going to be built where the net result is going to be no burden to the taxpayer, right? Uh, so. The, the threshold for that is are we going to have enough cars parking in Portsmouth, paying the parking fees uh, from day one or close to day one moving forward? I think the, the long term, absolutely. 
the long term for this parking garage, for a parking garage in general, as long as you're not being completely stupid about it, is the city's going to net make money. Short term for parking garages could be that there's an outlay, right? An exp a short term expenditure for a long term gain. And so I think that's pretty clear for the short term. I think, you know, with the, the raising of rates uh, that's happening Sunday uh, to help offset that, uh, and with what I would expect is a lot of activity in the new garage, sure. As we raise rates, do we force people into the streets to park in spots otherwise residents, many of whom don't have their own parking spaces, would be parking in? Right. So uh, this has been happening for a long time, actually. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to live on Hanover Street on the edge of downtown. I, had a, I looked over Worth Lot in Portsmouth's only resident-only parking zone. And we still had people from Massachusetts and Vermont parking in our street, right? So very sensitive to that. I had on-street parking only uh, uh, that I had to deal with. And so, sure, the more parking pressure we get on the downtown district, the more people are likely to, to edge out. The people that are moving out to the edges uh, are uh, not the tourists that are coming in. To, to most people that are coming up from New York or New Jersey or whatever, it's laughable, right? Uh, they pay a parking ticket, sure. and that's, that's less than they would have paid for an hour with a parking somewhere else. The folks that are, are moving out to the, to the edges are the folks that are probably working downtown, again, on those first floors, right? They're working in the restaurants or the coffee shops, right. and then they're trying to desperately find some way of, of cutting their costs or not running out and feeding the meter. Yeah. And so I think we, we put ourselves, our city, our council in the past has been kicking this can down the road year after year. The cost of building parking garages mm -hmm. is getting more and more expensive every time we push it down. Okay. And having the second parking garage is going to give us that option to lower, thank you, to lower the cost of parking, which will, I think, ease that burden on our neighboring uh, okay. residents. Thanks, okay. Josh. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is Josh Sear, candidate for City Council, and it was very nice to meet you. Thanks thank you very for much for having talking me. with us Josh, tonight. thank you. Good thank talk you. to you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, everybody. Did we hit the time right? We did. We did, did it. Ready, ready, I got a kick. All right. Ready, ready close. I'm seconds. sorry, Eddie. <laughs>